Welcome everybody to the All Party Parliamentary Group for Special Educational Needs and Disabilities. This is absolutely incredible. We have over 1,400 people registered and participating in this event, which must be one of the biggest APPG events record, uh, recorded. You can tweet at APPG underscore SCND, use the hashtag, hashtag APPG SCND. The event is being interpreted in British Sign Language and live captions will be available, oh, sorry, captions will be available unfortunately after the recording. We couldn't get captions live during people speaking, so we're going to make a recording and then caption it and this will be out and available for anybody to watch within 48 hours. But we do have a British Sign Language interpreter, thank you so much Alison, uh, who will be signing uh, throughout this. If you require, if you need to see the British Sign Language interpreter, can you please send a chat message using the chat function to all panelists with a message saying that you need the uh, BSL interpreter and then you'll get instructions for how you can see it. And a subtitle version will be available in the next few days. If there are any MPs who are in the meeting as attendees and therefore not on screen as panelists, please can you click the raise your hand button or write in the chat function. We need all MPs on screen with videos turned on to take part in the vote. Similarly, if there are any staff of MPs who are on screen as a panellist, please send a chat message to all panellists and we will make you an attendee. The APPG launched only weeks ago. Our event on the 3rd of March aimed to give children with special education needs, their parents and carers, a greater voice in both the Houses of Commons and the House of Parliament. We'll be hearing from a range of speakers and an opportunity to ask questions. If you have a question to ask, then please use the ask the question button and uh, on the bottom of your screen, and then each of you can vote on the most popular questions. So you can submit your own question, but if someone else has asked a question that you like, you can vote for theirs. We will ensure that any questions are taken up with the Minister, and the APPG intends to summarise them in a letter following today's event. When we met as officers across party of MPs, we recognised the immense issues that are before us. However, the impact of COVID-19 on children with SCND has been profound. We've decided to make this the focus of our attention. That's why today we're delighted to launch our inquiry into the impact that COVID-19 has had on children and young people with SCND, specifically the impact of the transition. We will be holding evidence sessions and inviting submissions from all stakeholders on this. Our inquiry will be swift and aims to have key recommendations formulated by the end of this year. Details of the inquiry and how to respond are on the APPG website, details of which are also being posted in the chat function during today's event. But before we get into the main event, there is an announcement I wish to make. Um, I'm sad to say I will have to step down as chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group. This is because I was delighted that Keir Starmer has invited me to become a shadow minister in the education team. And unfortunately, that um, conflicts with being chair of the SEND um, all part of parliamentary group. But I will, of course, continue as an officer and continue as an advocate for children and families with SEND. But it means we need to hold an election for my replacement. I'm pleased that at the close of nominations, two members of the House have been nominated. Olivia Blake MP and Sally Ann Hart MP. We will now hold that election and invite the Secretariat to outline the procedures. And I promise to those who are watching, this won't take too long at all. I'm going to hand over to Rob Kelsall to outline how this election is going to work. Thank, thank you, Chair, and it's delighted to uh, provide, provide Secretariat support for uh, the All Parliamentary Group uh, for SEND. Uh, as Emma's outlined, uh, we've got two candidates, Olivia, Olivia Blake, Labour, Sheffield Allen, Sally Ann Art, Conservative, Hastings and Rye. The vote will be conducted via Outlook email using voting buttons. 
but this is obviously for parliamentarians. Please be by your parliamentary email in Outlook during this meeting in order to cast your vote. As with a vote in person, you will need to be in the room in order to vote. And obviously those parliamentarians who have registered for the event and actually in the meeting uh, will be the ones um, entitled to vote in the election. You will receive an email to your parliamentary email address from appgsyn at nht.org.uk and we'll have the choice to vote for either Blake or Hart using the Outlook voting buttons. The email should be in your inboxes imminently. Uh, I'm going to pass back to the chair uh, whilst that voting takes place. Uh, thank you, Emma. Thank you. And while that takes place, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, um, who is Stephen Kingdom, is the campaign manager of the Disabled Children's Partnership. The Disabled Children's Partnership have been doing a report into life in lockdown for children with SCND, and I'm really pleased he can join us to talk through his findings. So welcome, and over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today about our, um, our survey and our findings. Um, for people who don't know, the Disabled Children's Partnership is a coalition of more than 70 charities and other organisations who come together to campaign for improved health and social care provision um, for disabled children and their families. In May, we ran a survey of parent carers on the impact of COVID-19 on their children and the rest of their families. The survey covered caring, uh, quality of information families received, health, social care, education and family finances. We had a great response. We received over 4,000 completed surveys. The findings of the survey need to be seen in the context of parent carers already facing a massive caring role without sufficient support and a system that was already in crisis. For example, prior to coronavirus, 24% of parent carers were providing more than 100 hours of care a week. Only 4% of parent carers were getting the support they needed to safely care for their disabled children. And there was an annual funding gap across health and social care of 1.5 billion pounds. So, so coronavirus came on top of that existing situation and, and really produced a perfect storm. Our survey found an increased caring load for parent carers and for the siblings of disabled children. Many families have seen the little support they received stop altogether and this was having an impact on both the mental and physical health of all members of the families. Families were facing financial pressures both in terms of reduced incomes and increased costs and there were particular concerns going forward particularly for those families where children were shielding. The top three concerns we heard from parent carers were about children's behaviour and mental health, the impact on their friendships and on managing homeschooling, and what would happen if the parents themselves contracted COVID-19. To quote one parent, the impact is absolutely huge. There's no break from caring. It's really, really intense and quite overwhelming, and you're just left to it. It isn't just homeschooling. It's living, breathing, physio, communication, lifting, feeding, stimulating interaction, trying to keep yourself sane, trying to homeschool another child. The list is non-stop and endless, and no one's there to help. Turning in a bit more detail to some of the specific findings from the report. 72% of parent carers have been providing a lot more care than before lockdown, with 68% saying that siblings have been providing a lot more care for their disabled brothers or sisters. Prior to lockdown, only 38% had been receiving support from services with caring. And of those, more than three quarters had seen all support stop. And of course, lockdown rules meant that informal support on which families relied, um, such as from friends and family, had also stopped. 70 to 80% of parents reported declines in the mental health of their children both disabled children and their non-disabled siblings, and of themselves and their partners. 
nearly half of parents reported declines in their children's general and physical health. Therapies and other support had stopped for half of those who had been receiving them, and two thirds had had health or social care assessments delayed. Parents have been concerned about seeking medical help and the safety of doing so. 44% had stopped had not sought help for their disabled child when it was needed, and 54% had not sought help for themselves or for their partner. And nearly two thirds said the lockdown was having a negative impact on their child's disability or condition. On education, the government of course has said that school places would be available for children who had education, health and care plans, but the reality is the majority were not in school. Parents reported a variety of reasons for not taking up a school place. 43% have been concerned about the health of the child or someone else shielding in the household. 14% said their child did not want to attend school. One in five said the school had informally advised against it and about one in 10 said they'd be informally advised following a risk assessment not to attend. And similar proportion uh, said that the offer did not meet their child's needs. Parents were finding homeschooling difficult. More than 60% were concerned about the amount of homeschooling they were providing for their disabled child and for their siblings. And nearly a third said they were not getting specific home education support from the school in relation to their child's special educational needs. And for those going through formal assessment processes, two thirds of assessments have been delayed and nearly one half of annual reviews have lapsed or been put on hold. As I said, lockdown has also been having an impact on family finances. 39% of families have had their income reduced during lockdown, while 61% have seen an increased cost of living. The top things on which they were spending more money were food and food deliveries, utilities, the cost of homeschooling, such as laptops, sensory or specialist equipment so they could care for their child safely at home, uh, replacing items damaged due to challenging behaviour and expenditure on personal protective equipment. And one in five families said they will go into debt as a result. Now a survey taking place in May means it took place um, at the height of lockdown. However, the issues it remain, raised remain. We hear from parents that they are particularly concerned that they will be left behind as, as the country moves out of lockdown and even more forgotten about, particularly as the majority of children return to school in September. They're concerned about the implications for their children and, and their families on the changes to advice on shielding and feel uncertain uh, and scared about what that means for them. And they urgently need short services and support such as short breaks, respite care and therapies reinstated. They will need reassurance and support for their children to return to school in September. And for those children who are not able to return to school at that time, they will need tailored provision to ensure they do not fall further behind. We're therefore calling on the government to have a clear plan in place to support disabled children and their families over the coming months, resulting in disabled children and young people receiving a regular amount of funded support with care, emotional and physical well-being needs at home and in the community. The right support funded and in the right and in place for children to return to school and for homeschooling for those who can't return. And priority to be given to those children who cannot attend school due to complex health conditions or the need to continue to shield. And these calls go alongside our existing calls on government to prioritise disabled children and their families, including by appointing a minister for disabled children with responsibilities across government as a point of coordination and clear accountability. Uh, to review the existing guidance and legal framework for health and social care for disabled children, and to ensure that disabled children and their families form a key part of the Department for Education's care review, and to provide the additional money required to fill the funding gaps for health and social care services, and to introduce a dedicated children's, disabled children's innovation fund. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that really insightful um, look at some of the work that you've been doing. Um, just a message to the MPs who are having issues with voting. We are sorting that out. So if you can just bear with me while we work out, um, work out that system. And for everybody else uh, listening, I'm very delighted to introduce our next speaker, who is a parent called Amanda Elliott. 
and I'm delighted that she's been able to come because I think it's so crucially important that the APPG for SEND hears directly from parents as well. So Amanda, over to you. Hi Emma, thanks very much and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, I, my name is Amanda, I'm a parent of a young man who is autistic and has a complex cost, constellation of conditions that make his mental health very vulnerable and some of his behaviour uh, a challenge for the people who work and live with him. Um, I'm talking in my capacity not only as a parent but as an active member of a number of uh, parent ed campaigns that have been running for the last couple of years, Send Action and Hackney Special Education Crisis and the Send Crisis. We've been uh, at the forefront of, of, of trying to bring this issue up the agenda. So it's, it's really great that we've been invited here to speak and have a, a role in your committee. Um, during lockdown, it's, it's been evident that, that the impact on families, just as the CCP um, report has, has, has amplified, the impact has been absolutely devastating. I just want to talk about a couple of cases in our local area. That, that completely shocked me. There was a, a young man with um, a young teenager with a life limiting condition who was in a, living in a hostel with his single parent and two siblings. Um, he needed regular transfusions and he's in a wheelchair and has continence issues. He was, uh, he was told to shield and was unable to because all their, their, their stuff was in a communal area. The, the involvement of social care was minimal. He wasn't able to go to school. He didn't have an internet connection, so couldn't uh, do any of the homework that was being sent. Uh, the whole situation was an absolute disaster, and um, that young man still isn't back at school and has missed an enormous amount of support. Another young man, an autistic young man, who's one of those uh, young people who's at high risk of hospitalisation, who takes a lot of time to get used to any routine, even a small one, was uh, rather abruptly told he couldn't go to school through an, his special school through an risk assessment and the parents were left with no therapeutic support, no advice, no behavioural support. So um, those are just two examples and there are many more of, of, of the actual practical impact. I think what most families have felt after the initial uh, sweet spot of having your children close during a, um, a national crisis was uh, an escalating pressure pot having to juggle homework, care, um, being a nurse, being a carer, uh, uh, lack of sleep, anxiety, difficulties with shopping. Um, the cumulative impact was just it's shocking. And I think, but the thing I want to focus on is less about that now, but more about what lies away ahead for, for our families, which is one of the biggest issues is the mental health needs of those children going back to school. Now it's affected all children, but our children already have a massive gap in terms of educational uh, achievement and also around their life outcomes. And that gap is now a yawning chasm thanks to the current crisis and the falling away of support. Uh, I think what really shocked us was when the um, legal duties were eased so quickly and the timescales for education, health and care plans were, were abandoned. What it felt like was those hard fought for rights that our children have were like gossamer. They, they were so easily dispensed with. And, and actually, frankly, most families were terrified that they'd never be reinstated. And one of the demands that families absolutely need, they want some targeted support and funding around the mental health needs of their children going back to school. That's vital because there are so many children that are going to find that reintegration impossible or, or very hard. They were struggling with school before. Um, additionally, the, the, the easements on the timescales of education, health and care plans are not going to be back in, those timescales are not going to be back in place to the end of September after the start of school. Um, for, for many children, that means they can't go back to school. There is no support. What's the expectation? Yet there's been no change into the behaviour codes and, uh, and no real reasonable adjustments for them. So we, in terms of demand, we feel that, that that's absolutely essential. I think um, not only is the impact of this crisis, I think one of the things that's really most parents would agree on and, and any professionals as well, is that the COVID crisis hasn't caused the problem. It's just 
amplified the problems that were existing in the system already. A lot of the people didn't have much support or the support was very hollow or, or useless. I mean, there's one example I, I saw the other day where a family had been battling a ch of, a, of a child with Down syndrome and had been fighting hard for early intervention speech and language therapy in the child's plan. They managed to secure four sessions of direct therapy a year for that child, and that's considered a bit of a standard around speech and language. Yet it's sub-therapeutic, that child, it's, it's token. I mean, then these, these are the sort of examples of where, even before COVID, there was very little and it was hard fought for, but now there's all that's fallen away. I, I just want to highlight something else which I came across last week, which just absolutely terrified me, which was there was a report in The Guardian about the deaths of five autistic young people in, in Kent uh, through suicide and, uh, and another child in um, Essex. These are, these are children with a profile like my son, and I know there's many parents out there who have uh, children with similar needs and challenges. And while it's not possible to say there was an absolute causal link between uh, their suicide and, 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 and the loss of um, the, their structures and their schooling and their support, uh, I think most of those parents know that, it was ju that, that their children had been through enormous struggles prior to COVID and COVID was, was the straw that broke the camel's back for those children. So not only is the, um, the impact of this crisis on an ordinary creaking and failing system um, likely to affect the educational chances of our children and, and stop them thriving and also on the life chances but actually for some children it's been absolutely fatal and I think I don't want to mince my words around that because that's actually at the worst end the consequences of this a system that's not working. Um, I think really the, quite the, the demands really from parents are that there is some targeted and targeted funding for our children and that also this review is so welcome but to be honest there's, we've just come off the back of a number of reviews and investigations and inquiries the evidence is already out there that something radical needs to change to the system that our children's rights need to be protected they, they shouldn't be so easily dispensed with I mean that was just horrifying during the COVID and that the local authorities have statutory duties to our children it isn't just a a nice thing to do and so really I think you know whatever we do from this inquiry is that it's quick and there are, there is action very fast and, and, and an impact that, that makes the difference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that Amanda. Um, just for all the MPs again sorry about the virtual fun we're having trying to vote when we're not all in the same room. Um, if you can reply to the email from the APPG with either Blake or Hart in it rather than using the virtual voting. I think that's a really important point Amanda said about inquiries and it's nearly a year to the day that the um, Education Select Committee did our inquiry into SEND which the government have yet to respond to. Um, but one thing that the APPG can do is, is not just do inquiries but it can be that continual voice in putting letters into ministers and asking ministers for responses and but I do, I do sense the frustration when we've had the, something like the Education Select Committee's report and yet there's still no movement on it. So uh, MPs, if you say again, if you can just reply to the email saying either Blake or Hart, that would be great. Uh, and then I, I promise I will be handing over the chair at some point. Um, I just want to introduce our next speaker. Yes? Sorry, sorry, just uh, on the Education Select Committee report, um, it's now I think nearly eight months since the SEND report was published by the pre our predecessor Education Select Committee. Uh, it, we raised it at the committee this morning saying that we should be writing to the department saying that this is totally unacceptable. The, the department had indicated that we want to expect a, a response uh, soon, but you know, with, with so much, uh, like so much else, th these things tend and have tended to drift. So, you know, we, we, we're writing again to the to the department asking for a formal response to the select committee report. Because from my perspective, I, I believe the, the report was well received out there in the country. And um, it, it just seems a, a terrible shame that the government, despite the, the crisis that we've been through, have sat on it now through the DFE for eight months almost. 
Thanks, Ian. So I'll just move on to our next speaker, uh, Polly Sweeney, who's the partner at Rook Irvin Sweeney and chair of the Law Society's Mental Health and Disability Committee. So we're really keen to actually have a lawyer and that expertise in, because there's been an awful lot of concern about what the impacts of the COVID-19 legislation has had on people with SEND. Um, so welcome. Thank you, Polly. And I'll hand over to you now. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm hoping that I'll be able to cover two perspectives. First of all, as a solicitor that specialises in special educational needs and disability law, and to talk a little bit about the legal challenge that has been brought against the government measures, but also to share my perspectives as um, chair of the Law Society's Mental Health and Disability Committee from a wider perspective. And I think as Emma has just said, I'm focusing not on the impact of COVID-19 itself, because of course it wasn't a virus that took these measures, but on the impact of the government measures in response to the pandemic. And I think just to be a technical lawyer, to clarify that I'm only going to be talking about England, and I apologise for that, and I don't mean to ignore Wales, but these particular measures have only been brought in in England. So, um, in terms of what measures I am speaking about, well, these are the powers that were um, introduced under the Coronavirus Act um, that were subsequently enacted by the Secretary of State for Education in, at the end of April 2020. So it's really two main decisions. The first was a decision that initially covered May, but has been extended to cover June and July as well to modify the core legal duties on local authorities under Section 42 of the Children and Families Act. And that's the, the core legal duty to secure provision which is set out in a child or a young person's education, health and care plan. And instead of it being an absolute duty, it's been replaced with a requirement to use reasonable devils. And so this is a core legal entitlement that has been in place undisturbed for decades through successive pieces of legislation. And the second measure that I'm going to be talking about um, is the decision to issue amendment regulations which provide exceptions, they're known as the COVID exceptions, to the strict timescales that local authorities are required to follow during the planning and reviewing process for EHC plans, where these can't be met because of a decision relating to coronavirus. So with that in mind and turning first to the, the legal challenge, um, this is a judicial review which has been brought by two claimants. Um, they're both children with special educational needs and who have education, health and care plans. And both have lost almost all of the provision which is set out in their EHC plans. Um, of course, their positions are not unique. Um, and we have already heard today that, that these, this is the impact that has been felt by, by many, many families with children, young people with special educational needs. Um, I think also it's right to record that both these families recognise that during a pandemic, where a lot of children are at home, there is necessarily going to be some parts of their AHC plan that they, they just can't be delivered at the moment. And I think both families are really clear that they would never want to take any action either against a school or a local authority to try and force their rights to provision which just can't be delivered. You know, families generally, you know, they report to me that they're exhausted, they're not going to be pursuing litigation unless they think it's really going to make a difference to the provision that their child or young person is receiving. But I think what they both also think is that there are parts of their EHC plans which could be delivered at the moment and which are not. Um, and the difficulty with the reasonable endeavours duty is that it provides no legal certainty at all for anybody involved as to what that actually means in the context of a pandemic. Um, I think it's also right to record that you know, we don't have anyone from the Department of Education speaking and um, the Secretary of State does oppose. So what I'm going to tell you about the claimant's arguments, I think it's only fair the Department of Education don't agree with what, what is being said. Um, but in terms of the particular grounds um, that are being raised, um, the first 
ground is a failure to consult, um, a failure to consult in particular with parents um, of children and young people with special education needs, and also young people, of course, themselves, children and young people themselves. Um, secondly, that there was a failure to carry out a sufficient inquiry before making the decision. Um, thirdly, that it was irrational in, in a legal sense, um, so, it was, um, so it wasn't a reasonable decision to determine that it was with May and June and July, that it was appropriate or proportionate. Um, another um, concern that's being raised in the case is that the amendment regulations, the way that they were laid before Parliament, meant that there was no scrutiny before they came into force. So there was no opportunity for those to do that in Parliament. Um, and then finally, that there was a breach of um, the duty under Section 7 of the Children and Young Persons Act, and that is a duty to have regard to the well-being of children prior to making these decisions. So, just I considered the case on papers, um, and um, and has said that it is um, it so it has certified it for expedition, which means it gets heard quickly, recognising that it is urgent. Um, and has recorded that the case raises issues of serious concern in relation to vulnerable children with special educational needs and how those needs are met in a pandemic. And I think we have, we have absolutely been overwhelmed by the evidence that's been provided to us from families and representative organisations um, which show the, the devastating impact of these measures on children and young people. And the claimants believe that it is this evidence which the DfE and all the sector states should have before making these decisions. Um, so um, what we have had though by way of update since then is on the 2nd of July the Department of Education announced in guidance that unless the evidence changes it will not be issuing further national notices to modify these duties. Um, but, and I think this is important, there will be consideration given to local flexibilities um, and the relaxation on timescales will remain in force. Um, and so you ain't their legal challenge because the July notice remains in force um, and the regulations themselves haven't been withdrawn. And so there remains a power um, for the Secretary of State to issue further notices at any time if the evidence were to change. Um, and the hearing has been listed for, um, for determination on 29th and the 30th of July. Um, and it will be a virtual hearing, we understand, by Skype. Um, so that is an update on where we are with the legal challenge. As I said, perspective of the claimant. Um, and what the claimant's concerns are in that case, and it will ultimately be decided by, by the court. Um, but I suppose just in the, the short time that I have left, just I suppose from a wider perspective in my role um, as the, the chair of the Law Society's Mental Health and Disability Committee, um, as an organisation, the Law Society has got a, um, a, plays an important role and its members play an important role in supporting vulnerable people um, and in particular clients with disabilities who may be impacted by the um, and part of the role of the committee is to keep under review and promote improvements in law and practice and procedure which affects disabled people. And so the Law Society has had two main areas of concern regarding the impact of the government's response to the coronavirus. So firstly, um, on the impact to members, clients with disabilities, and secondly, on access to justice. Um, and throughout this period, the Law Society has been engaging with the government to try and highlight the impact of the emergency legislation and particularly its impact on vulnerable groups and those of disabilities. Um, and I think it is very clear, as we have heard already today, that these measures um, have had a serious impact on children and young people. And, um, and I think this has also been supported by the Children's Commissioner, um, who um, has, um, has taken the view that these measures were not proportionate, um, and the Law Society shares those concerns. Um, as the Children's Commissioner has also noted, not meeting their legal duties in this area. Um, so I think 
the Law Society obviously welcomes, as do I, the announcement that unless the evidence changes, no further notices will be issued. But, but there is an obvious concern about what these local flexibilities might look like. And it's important that they don't give rise to the same issues that have been seen in relation to the Care Act easements. Um, and I think the law, and the law Society is also recommending that the government formally monitor the extent to which local authorities are using these measures and the impact this is having on children and young people. Um, and then just finally on access to justice. Um, and hopefully a slight more positive end um, to what I've been speaking about. Um, and so we've been looking at access to justice and the, the impact of the coronavirus on a move in many court jurisdictions to remote hearings. And I think many people, many practitioners have been reporting that the move to remote hearings in the Special Educational Needs Tribunal has been very positive and has been a really positive experience. For all those who work in this area will know that for some time there has been um, a, a backlog of has been built cases and there's been quite a high number of adjournments. And I think the tribunal has worked incredibly hard during this pandemic to use it as an opportunity to clear that backlog and to make sure that cases are heard promptly. Um, and so I know that there are already um, thoughts about whether that might be a possible solution in the longer term. Um, and we would certainly suggest that there should be an evaluation of the use of remote hearings within SEND tribunals. Um, I think it's important though, if there is any evaluation, that there is um, a perspective from litigants in person, because with you know, a lot of people who are talking about this are talking about it from the perspective of lawyers using remote hearings rather than, than litigants in person. So that's something which potentially is, is a more positive impact um, on access to justice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for that, Polly. Um, I think we've finally got the result of the elections through. So if I can just hand over to Rob for a moment, if you're there, Rob, just to announce who the new chair of the APPG is, please. Thank you, uh, thank you, Emma. So of the votes uh, that took uh, taking place, just we've had 25 votes uh, to two in favour of uh, Olivia Blake. So. Uh, uh, Libby obviously is du duly elected and uh, we look forward to serving as secretariat uh, to the new uh, to the new chair and, and officers. Thank you. Delighted um, Olivia's taken over as chair. That's wonderful news. So I will um, officially step down, but not very far. I still remain as an officer and hand over to Olivia to introduce our final speaker. And just before I do that, please do keep putting the questions in the Q&A box and voting for your questions because all our panelists are staying so that they can answer questions at, at the end of this but thank you everyone it has been a pleasure in this short time I've been chair of this group and um, I promise I will continue to support it but welcome and congratulations Olivia. Um, thank you Emma and thank you colleagues for um, electing me and thank you Emma for everything that you've done for the committee I know you've been working really hard um, and I wish you all the best in your new role. Um, just to move on to the next speaker then, uh, the next speaker is Marie, uh, Marika Miles, who's a head teacher at Baycroft School, uh, Fairham and, and um, chair of the NH, NAHT SEND Sector Council. Thank you very good, very much and good afternoon everybody. Um, I'm very conscious of time, um, so um, I won't cover everything on behalf of my families, but I can't speak for anybody um, about SCN without honouring the families I work with, um, the resilience and good grace and optimism that they've shown throughout this. It's always been the honour of a lifetime to work with the families that I do, but the care and appreciation they've shown for each other and for our school staff is, is just astonishing. And I, I could not possibly speak without mentioning that and, and thanking them and as say honouring everything that they've endured in this period. Um, so just to focus on some aspects of school leadership, because I wouldn't dare to talk about what they've experienced, our families and children, but I can talk about the, the, the school's aspect. Um, I've learned quite a few things over this period myself, and none of them are, are happy things. Um, I've learned just how, um, how disparate our system remains, how ineffective the 
uh, health, education and social care partnerships are and how fractured they've been by a crisis like this. And Amanda said earlier, this hasn't created the problem, but it has absolutely blown apart how many problems we have got with our system. And it's epically failed children at this time because of the inherent problems that we have created over a, a number of years. I've also learned how spectacularly naive the world is about special educational needs and about special education um, and how deaf they seem to be to our attempts to share and enlighten and how reasonable and persistent we've been in trying to highlight issues and actually just how mid misunderstood um, they are. And I've also learned how cavalier the world is about using the term vulnerable and how there is a real lack of subtlety and specificity in the way that it's been used over this period of time. And I'm really concerned about the hurt and anxiety and disenfranchisement that has caused to different families um, in the way that, that people haven't been specific about how they've described vulnerability and the implications they've made from that. And actually, what a lip service term that is, because in fact, vulnerability seems to be on everybody's lips apart from when it comes to putting hands in pockets and putting things in place. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that from a school leader's perspective. I've also learned what a bad, bad fit school is for some children. And as one plus how utterly transformational it has been for some children to have a blended world of education, one which so many parents have cried out for over years and which hasn't been made available. And I think this is revolutionary in the way that we might be able to work where suitably resourced and supported. And it leads me to be very hungry for a real fundamental rethink of what education means for this country and how far we're prepared to go to accommodate the needs of children to change our system to fit them and not the other way around. Um, our colleagues um, and parents have told me that they're very concerned about um, the bullish messages in the press about attendance. I've had a lot of distressed messages from parents and colleagues where parents who have stood over hospital beds for days and weeks just willing their child to live feel that they are going to be forced, fined and threatened into ensuring that they come to school. Um, I think my parents know best and they know what is best and I'm very proud to work with them for that reason. Um, and our parents are not silly and they can see that in special schools and special education, some of the provisions in the guidance are just so difficult to implement. Um, and that's a huge concern for colleagues. We carried out a survey with 578 respondents and the overwhelming response from our colleagues was they are just desperate about how the most important measures in the hierarchy and the guidance are possible to implement in schools which are fundamentally under-resourced and overcrowded as just a starting point. Um, and there are many aspects of the arrangements that cause ongoing and huge concern. If I can give an example in my school, I have a room of 28 metres squared, which 15 people are going to need to occupy for six hours a day in September in order to run my school at full capacity in the way that I've been directed to. We are massively concerned about school transport the availability and um, the, the way in which it can be used to support measures which have been recommended to us, such as um, phased um, arrivals and staggered opening times, which is just simply not available in some authorities and with some, some transport provisions. And, and a real concern for me, which I'm already seeing and many colleagues are, are seeing, is a, 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 the implementation of hygiene measures in transport. Uh, there is no requirement for drivers to wear PPE. And so, you know, I have children that are taxied for an hour each way by a driver who may have driven multiple, multiple other people in their vehicle throughout a weekend, throughout a week, um, and who, who then come into school. And, and that just doesn't seem to have been addressed. Uh, we have huge problems over, over bubbles and over the social distancing and the measures that, that have been uh, again, uh, put to us as, a, as critical in preventing um, spread of infection. This is not practical in schools where, again, we have really limited space and really limited resources. Um, and, and it goes on to concerns about uh, procedures that uh, raise um, uh, aspiration and respiratory um, situations and, and the rooming and the, and the support for that. Um, and of course PPE, which has been an ongoing issue for us from the start of the crisis and continues to be an area where there's a huge lack of clarity. 
A lot of this um, is surmountable because we're heads and we make it work and we make it work for our families. And I want to tell you about the point for me and for many of my colleagues, which was the most devastating. And it's come out in our survey from our members. I don't cry often. I've seen a lot over the years with my family um, and with my, my families at school and what they've been through. And we're very resilient as a breed. But there was a Saturday morning when I wept in my kitchen and my husband said to me, what is this? What is the crisis? And, and I heard myself saying, I don't know what I'm going to say to my families. I don't know what I'm going to say, how I'm going to manage their expectations, because we are flat out doing everything we can for them. Um, and I feel that they'll think I've let them down. And that's really over the funding situation, which continues we've picked up a huge amount of concern from our school leaders about the year seven catch-up funding. So on the day that a billion pound was announced for schools nationally, my school lost 21,000 pounds from our budget by the cessation of the year seven catch-up funding. Um, and we're still awaiting details of the distribution of the COVID catch-up, um, but I'm not sure that that's going to mitigate the loss at the moment for 2021. So my devastation was feeling that my parents are hearing headlines that say you've got a billion pounds in the estate of education. And I was actually worse off, much worse off as a result. And, and I may be, unless we get clarity about the distribution of that funding. It continues because even if that's mitigated in this budget year, the, um, the commitment's been made to redistribution into the, um, uh, the uh, um, sorry, in, into the um, uh, national funding formula, um, but that doesn't apply to special schools. So a real concern for us is that even if the COVID immediate top up funding perhaps mitigates some of the loss, we don't know where that's money going to go into future years. And at the moment, just to give you a really real live example, the money loss means I either have to lose my nurse or my speech and language therapist because neither of those are paid for by the NHS. They're paid for me out of school funds and they represent about that amount of money that I would need to save not to be in a deficit as things stand. Um, and on top of that, uh, really special schools are disproportionately affected uh, and AP equally, when I say special schools, I mean all specialist provision, um, by the additional costs of COVID, which we're being told we need to meet from our budgets. But um, it is disproportionate for us. There's thousands of pounds to be spent on PPE, particularly in PMLD schools and schools where there's a huge amount of care. There's a great deal of extra cleaning and really scrupulous cleaning that we require for our very, very vulnerable children. And that is a clear and demonstrable additional cost. Um, we have a huge amount of extra um, staffing where we're having to bubble in some schools on a bubble of one to really keep safe. Additional dividers and room arrangements and say places where um, we've had to move where procedures are carried out that, that um, produce um, droplets and, and are to do with aspiration. So, um, you know, again, my concern is that I'll be able to give my families even less than before and to manage their expectations. As I say, 80% of our respondents felt that was their biggest concern. And I think it's reflective of the, of the fact that, you know, special education leaders just want to do the best for their families. And it's a very uncomfortable message to give to people. Actually, I can't deliver what you need and I can't deliver what you think you're going to get from the headlines that you're reading um, and that which has been promised. So it's a very difficult time. Um, the other thing that we're just finally concerned about is building work not being done where adaptations need to be made for students transitioning. And we've heard reports from across the country about where there's been a delay, where a child is transferring school. It may be that ramping, it may be that facilities are not built in place. Um, and, and we know that that is a, a particular effect of, of the conditions of COVID. Um, and, and hopefully there will be a solution to that. I think that's for, that's it from me. Thank you, Olivia. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, right, we'll move on to uh, questions now. Um, I can see from the ask a question function that you've all been busily writing questions. We've got 149. Um, but don't worry if you don't get an answer to yours today. We'll be using all the questions um, as, a, as a basis for a letter to the minister following the meeting. Um, You've also been voting on them, so I will go through in priority order and ask the panel 
uh, just to raise their hands if they wouldn't mind if they would like to um, answer. Uh, so the first question is, please can schools be given the flexibility to develop differentiated attendance policies to support young people struggling to return to school and alleviate parental fears around attendance related fines and challenges? And that's from the Oxfordshire Parent Carers Forum. Who would like to take that? Anyone? Uh, no one's volunteering, so I'm just wondering if uh, I can strong arm one of you into it, if that's okay. <laughs> so, um, Polly, do you have a view on that? Oh, you're on mute. Could you just summarise it for me again? Sorry. Yeah, basically, it's to uh, see if there could be a um, more flexibility in the um, in the attendance policy of young people returning to school, um, so that they're not getting fines for doing a bit more of a phased return. I think this is a, an issue which is so worrying for so many parents and the circumstances in which head teachers may exercise their discretion in terms of issuing fines. Um, ultimately, this is a question that we need to be putting to the Department of Education um, to be able to address. Um, if it helps, I'm, I, you know, I'm doing a seminar specifically looking at this in a week's time because I think it could take up a whole session in terms of talking about. Mm. But you know, I completely agree. We can't expect children and young people who have been out of education for many, many months to turn up at the beginning of September and start full time without any transition and potentially without their full provisions being in place. Mm. It's just not going to work. And I think it would be so wrong for parents to fear fines and of course you know the, these sanctions come with potential criminal prosecutions you know, these are serious sanctions and um, I would definitely suggest this is a question for the, for the DFE to help us with. And if you don't mind uh, Olivia um, it's Rob here so um, we've seen uh, the Minister for Education in Wales just last week uh, announce with the plans to uh, wider reopening of schools in, in Wales from September uh, that during that transition period to move schools from uh, you know where they are now to the full reopening that there actually will won't be a punitive fines uh, being meted out in 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 the nation of Wales so you know that that certainly is something that uh, you know we welcome in in the nation of Wales and you know you know I'm sure that we will uh, be party to the correspondence from from the APPG uh, to to the minister I mean it, it is uh, something again that is on the minds of many uh, you know people mm. parents, school leaders so yeah so we've seen it happen in Wales I know uh, why, why can't it happen here very good point uh, anyone else wants to come in on this one uh, yep Marika I'm um, just just to be solution focused I think what would be a really useful um, line of inquiry on this would be whether we can authorize virtual learning as attendance and have a, I know we've got sort of other, but really make it not a half-hearted grudging, oh well, you know, if they had to be away, actually this is a equality agreed alternative um, without opening that to abuse by perhaps people that might, you know, um, make that their, their habitual arrangement when we do want children in school, but actually it would be good if we could authorise online or off-site extended learning in, in a different way to the way it's coded at the moment. So the, ne the next question, again, will probably be more aimed at DFE, but uh, basically asking what funding will be made available for SEND children in mainstream school who before this crisis lacked funding to support um, their EHCP plans um, and have just fallen through the gaps um, during, these, during the crisis. So I guess that's one that we'll have to put to DFE, but does anyone have a view on um, what funding should be available? Anyone? No, I'm going to ask Stephen if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I mean, I think we agree that, um, that the government does need to look at the funding system for uh, supporting children in school, um, ensure that the, the right funding is there and the, the, the right incentives are there for how schools use their budgets. And I, I just stress also that that 
we need to not just have funding in schools going forward, but funding and supporting health and social care as well. Um, I think particularly at the moment where families have been struggling without the support they need for caring, where the cost of providing respite care and short breaks in the current environment is likely to be higher. Um, the government really needs to take a, a sort of rounded look at the funding across all three services um, and how they're provided and how the the funding incentives work between services to not not encourage um, cost shifting from the problem from one service to another, but have a more uh, joined up and holistic approach. Anyone else like to quickly comment on funding or shall we move on to the next question, which is quite an interesting one. Um, it's about um, the fact that there isn't currently a commissioner for disabled children uh, and young people. Um, and whilst there is a children's commissioner, a victims commissioner and an anti-slavery commissioner, uh, wouldn't it be strategically good to have someone to bring all these things together in that role? What do we make of that suggestion? Um, Marika, I can see you nodding, so I'm going to come to you first. <laughs> I think it it would because again um, I've, I've spent a lot of my career really um, bulking against always saying what about special what about special because I regard myself as an educator but I, I just think um, you know that the more I go on the more nuanced we we know that our world is and the more particular the the issues and so actually we do need a really powerful well-informed advocate who who has that particular lens on things that relate to children which would balance really well with the children's commissioner who makes some powerful points but but with all courtesy to her without acknowledgement of the real subtleties and the particular issues that relate to our children and their families so i think it would be excellent anyone else want to support that suggestion okay i, I would agree i think that you know, the children's commissioner has done a lot of work on this but special educational needs is such an important issue. And it, it's a, a system which everybody I think here would accept is in crisis at the moment. And, and I think trying to do that amongst a much wider role with a much wider remit, you just can't do it the justice it needs right now. Um, we, we, that, I think that people will generally agree with that. Um, we've got had a request to ask if any MPs have any, I, uh, any comments on that particular one as well? So I don't know if any MPs would be supportive of that, but I'm sure we can have that discussion outside of this as well. Um, so uh, taking that out of the room, but um, there's another, I think I'll take this as the last question because we are nearing three o'clock, but it's a really important one. Um, please can we have clarity regarding clinically vulnerable and extremely clinical vul clinically vulnerable and their attendance at school where socially distance is socially distancing is not possible. I think that's a really important one and one that we'll definitely be including in the letter. Um, would anyone like to pick up on those issues of, of um, you know, people who are shielding at the moment and um, what impact that might be having on top of a, a normal um, situation? Um, I think we'd say that's massively important. We're, we're hearing real concern from parents about what the new guidance on shielding means to them, what it means for their, for their children. Um, and of course, it's not just uh, children themselves who are shielding, but also what, um, what happens for children who are in households where someone else is shielding. And what does that mean for those children's school attendance going forward and so on. So I think more clarity around uh, shielding and the different levels of uh, clinical vulnerability are really important. Would any other panellists like to come in on that or? Can I just say on that one, Olivia? Yeah. That's okay. And um, that was raised in Parliament, actually, Stephen. Um, I was in for questions. It was raised by a Conservative Member of Parliament, which was the question around if your parent, as a parent, if you're shielding, do you still have to send your children to school? And um, I, you know, we sort of all agreed this was an excellent question. Now the government promised some uh, a written response to that, and I asked if that written response would be made available in the library for all MPs. So it might be worth following up as a, um, you know, with the APPG on that to see where is this response on the exact guidance on that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, we're running out of time, so I'd just like to fi uh, finish the meeting, if that's okay, and just say a thank, you, a massive thank you uh, to all our panelists, um, MPs, and but mostly 
everyone who's come along i can't believe how many people have come to this appg today it's really fantastic um we'll be updating the website with any key actions that come out of this meeting uh, and posting a recording of today's event um very soon uh, critically we will be getting our inquiry underway and together we can and we will uh, make a difference this is the start of our work as a newly formed appg and we hope you have found today's meeting helpful and we thank you all for your time and future contributions to our work. Thank you. And just to say, the chat will all be saved and, and incorporated as well as the questions. Well done, Olivia and Emma. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much. <laughs>